Um, what we're going to um, cover in tonight's talk is we're going to look at beekeeping before Brother Adam, um, the early years when Brother Adam became how he came to be working with the bees. We're going to look at the Isle of Wight seas, um, bee breeding, how it's different than queen rearing, why selective breeding honeybees is so complex compared to other animal husbandry, and what is the buckfast bee, and why we don't do it anymore, basically. So um, if, if, no, if you've never been to a Buckfast Abbey, this is, this is the back view. I took this photograph, um, I hastened to back, and, and it's set in the beautiful Devon countryside. Um, some of the monks used to swim in that little canal there, which actually goes down into um, a turbine. And is it an Archibinges screw? Yeah, it, it's a yeah. power generator, yeah. Anyway, the Abbey is famous for lots of things. Um, that's one we don't talk about too much, but... Um, and it's also, um, more importantly, home to a community of Benedictine monks. And one of the famous monks, most famous monks, of course, is Brother Adam. Now, I never met Brother Adam. He died long before I came to work at the Abbey. And the Buckfast Bee hadn't, wasn't bred at all while, while I was working here. Um, however, um, we owe our jobs. You know, we wouldn't have our jobs here if it wasn't for the work that Brother Adam did. So I think it's only you know, anyone with any curiosity would try and look at, you know, what kind of person he is and why he became so famous. So when Brother Adam was a young man, there was a large community of monks, Benedictine monks, and they, it was, the Abbey was fairly self-sufficient in that they grew their own food and they had bees and they were rebuilding the Abbey. And it was a big community of brothers and they all lived by the rule of St. Benedict, which is a kind of manuscript which sets out a guideline for their day. So um, it, their day start, or used to start in those days at two o'clock in the morning and they'd pray together and um, it, it would go on through the day and, and the whole day would be punctuated by them coming together for prayer. But in between that time, they did hard manual work, quite a lot of them. So this is, that's Brother Adam there, just outlined in the back row. I guess he would have been in his late 30s, 40 there. So these are the monks nowadays. Um, there are not so many of them. And as you can see, um, it's quite um, a mature community. And the Abbey um, is self-sufficient in a different kind of way. It's much more of a commercial Abbey now. You know, there's shops and there's um, cafe and there's um, a conference centre and there's a hotel so it functions in quite a different way but these monks still have a daily routine so they they have to have all the, go through all these things during the day although it's not maybe as strict as in brother adam's day so um, the, the services don't last for long um, any historical account is, is biased, at least partially reflective of the person telling the tale. So um, this is my account of um, history of beekeeping at Buckfast Abbey. And I've gleaned um, a lot of my information from Brother Adam's books, but also Leslie Bill's book, For the Love of Bees, which was published in 1998, but also from the archives. Um, I was lucky enough to be able to look at the archive photographs and also talking to the monks and, and, and just chatting to them about, you know, what went, went on and what kind of bloke Brother Adam was, really. So, so some of the monks that are here today still remember working with Adam? Yeah, quite a few mm. of those. The, the ones that you saw in that picture, most mm. of those remember Adam, yeah. So one thing's clear, though, um, no matter who you talk to, and I got very differing, differing opinions about Brother Adam, but... It's no doubt at all that he, he became a famous person. And I, I did say to the abbot at the time, you know, how come Brother Adam was so famous? Because there was a lot of people around doing what Adam did before he did it, you know, breeding the honeybee, creating um, an inbred hybrid and using that. And basically, um, it probably comes down to that. There is, people are very intrigued by the monastic life and it's, they're very curious about it. You know, these, these men that choose to live in a community and, and devote their lives to God, but there's also the romanticism that exists around the honeybee. Ex excuse me, Claire. Um, there's a lot of echo coming out. And, there is. Um, and I think it's because Martin's got his, um, uh, he, he's um, unmuted. If, if, if you mute Martin while you're speaking, it might improve. Just try it. Okay. 
and then uh, and then I unmute him when he speaks. Okay. Yeah, I can do that, Roger. Okay. Yep. Okay. Okay, and I'm really intrigued why Brother Adam became an apicultural celebrity. Um, and we all know beekeepers that are famous, you know, there's Roger and there's um, Tom Seeley and, and, and loads of people that are famous for their work with honeybees, but they're um, known to us beekeepers. But Brother Adam was actually famous amongst the general public and people that come to the Abbey, they know that the Abbey is famous for bees and they know Brother Adam's name. So it's intriguing why he became a famous celebrity when lots of people that have done great work with bees you know the general public don't know who they are from adam <laughs> so i did go around a lot of the monks and um ask you know what they knew about brother adam what he was really like and um very differing opinions um the impression without dropping anyone in it really is that he didn't suffer fools gladly and he was a very hard taskmaster so um father well, one of the monks, I won't say any names, one of the monks said um, he had to help him um, smoke the bees, you know, be his smoker boy. And he said, I couldn't do it right. He used to make me cry. So um, he was quite a hard, um, unforgiving man in lots of ways, but I think also a very driven man. And um, But if you talk to people that knew him, members of the general public, people that visited, they say he was a charming man. And, um, you know, he, he, he was a really nice person. So somewhere in there is the real Adam and to really understand him you have to go back to the reasons why he came to the Abbey and, um, and look at the history of the Abbey to really understand what made him tick. So as we know bees have always been part of monastic life since med medieval times. Um, there's always been a history of beekeeping you know for candle wax and because abbeys were very wealthy places um, but Brother Columban um, was beekeeper before Adam. And if you want to take this one, Martin. Um, yeah, bro Brother Columban was um, the, the guy that, that actually sort of took the bees from um, almost medieval times, as it were, um, and, and brought them into the 20th century then, because uh, when the abbey was rebuilt, it was Brother Columban that took the bees from Skep. Uh, skep bees and we've still got bee bowls here in the abbey uh, walls today and he took them from skep beekeeping and moved them on to what in those days were these newfangled um, movable frame hives and you can see quite a hodgepodge of different hives around in, in the apiary there but he, he was forward enough thinking to see that this was the, the, the way to go and he gave um, the young Adam who came to work with him, uh, a good grounding in, in what would be proper beekeeping, as it were. And he was actually a member of the Devon BKA, BBKA, wasn't he? Uh, yeah, uh, uh, Columban was actually sort of got a mention in dispatches in the British Beekeeping Journal uh, of the day, uh, which is quite a grand sort of annual um, book that was put together. And he, and he actually perfected one of these recipes for... Uh, soft candy so, so it came to be that um, it was it was noted the the um, beekeeper of importance at St Mary's uh, of Buckfast Abbey so so yeah it, the Abbey was on the map from a beekeeping point of view before Adam joined the team and some of the the hives you see there are French um, hives and some of those held 18 frames but we're going to go back again because um, one of the reasons why Adam was actually at the Abbey was because the Abbey was being rebuilt so I'm going to pass this over to Martin again for a bit of history. Uh, yeah the, um, the, the the good thing about uh, the, the, the Abbey was that it was founded way before the um, Norman conquest it was a Saxon Abbey in the early days and it was a Benedictine community but after the Norman conquest the old wooden structure was taken down and was rebuilt in stone in the Norman style. Uh, and the Abbey prospered uh, through to perhaps too much so, you could argue, that uh, by 1539, it came under the gaze of Henry VIII. And it was one of the abbeys that was uh, part of the dissolution of the monasteries uh, that happened in that day. Um, about 40 abbeys actually were, were um, broken up down here in the West Country at that particular time. but. Um, 
Buckfast remains fairly unique in the fact that it was rebuilt. And that happened in the late 1800s. Um, the Benedictines actually acquired the site and they set about wanting to rebuild it as a Catholic Benedictine community. And so it was that uh, they had to recruit staff in order to do that. And part of that recruitment was to the French and the German families where the Benedictine community was quite strong. And so uh, that's how Adam actually got here. He, he came as part of the rebuilding um, for the Abbey. And you can see in the pictures there, the, the monks themselves dressing the stone. A lot of the stone came from Bath and Portland, quite a soft stone. You can see one young chap there with a huge, great big saw and not a lot of health and safety working his way through that block. Um, you know, it, it, it was hard work and uh, it was part of the reason why they had to increase the community size in order to get the work done. And there was a father, Militus, who traveled, who was German, and he went back to Germany and sort of recruited young boys to come and be what you call alumni, so baby monks, basically. Ah, there's Adam just there. And the, um, these young boys, Adam was 11 when he came, this is in 1910, and um, they were basically educated in the classroom during the morning, um, normal, normal lessons, and then in the afternoon they had free time. Um, but um, at some point they would when they became 15 or 16, they would start working in the Abbey ground. So they would work in the gardens or they would be dressing the stone or they would be working in the kitchens. And Adam actually started um, working as a stonemason, which he liked for two years. He was a stonemason, but he had asthma or ill health. And um, they put him on um, working with Brother Columban, who was cooking, but also looking after the Abbey bees. And at some point, the, these boys would... Um, take novitiate vows and, and, and later on take their final vows to become monks, but they had a choice to leave if they wanted to. Um, and Adam never was an ordained monk. He wasn't a priest. He all stayed as a lay brother. And the lay brothers were basically um, not servants, but they, they ran the abbey. And so they didn't have the same religious commitments as the choir monks. So the choir monks um, basically would spend seven or eight hours in the church doing lots of praying. And um, the, the, the lay brothers would be out in the fields. And if the bell went at five to um, 12 for the um, Angelicas, then they would just put down their hose and, and do a little prayer then. So they didn't spend a lot of time in the church. They did a hard working day. And um, the picture you can see with the boy with the rabbits, that's Adam um, a few years on now. And he um, actually, they, the, the boys caught um, a bait, a wild rabbit and stuck it in the greenhouse. And then Adam's brother had sent him some money. So he bought some more rabbits and that was his first foray into breeding. And as you can imagine, um, they ended up with quite a lot of rabbits. And then the next picture there, you can see Adam just there. Again, he looks to be 15 or 16 just there. Um, at that time, Brother Columba, um, there was, um, they'd moved the hives into the Burgess Perfection Hive, which is a local hive made in Exeter, and it was a double-walled hive, very similar to a WBC, it took national frames, I think, and um, instead of it being tapered, um, what are those things called? Outers? Uh, the, the, the lifts on the, the on lifts, the yeah. yeah. Yeah, the, the, the lifts were parallel. So you could actually double, if you turn one of the lifts upside down, it would fit on and make a double-double lift. Anyway. Um, but Brother Columban was no stranger to importing queens, and often they, they, they imported directly from Germany or from Italy, and even brought in queens, local, well, cross hybrids from people like Sladen. So this is um, an advert in the British Bee Journal in 1905. So Sladen is advertising his golden prolifics, which were supposed to be, I think, an Italian black bee cross, and he used an isolation site and he was looking at Mendel's laws of inheritance. So very similar to what Adam was doing with his bees, but this is 20 years earlier. There was also um, Samuel Simmons with his British Goldens and White Stars. So all this work was being done long before Brother Adam um, even thought about it. And at that time, there were around 45 colonies um, split into apries on site but by about 1916 and this is when Adams began to work with the bees 20, 29 of these colonies were lost by a devastating disease which appeared to be sweeping through the British Isles 
um, and was dubbed the Isle of Wight disease. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about what the Isle of Wight disease may or may not have been, but the ones which survived, the 16 colonies that survived, Adam believed were either of Carniolan or Italian stock. So he believed that the ones that um, were wiped out were the indigenous black bees, but we'll look at that. Do you want to go on, Martin, on this one? Yeah, the, the, the Isle of Wight disease um, was, was something that sort of waxed and waned and had sort of probably three decently good epidemics going through the, the British bee population between 1905 and about 1919. And, and although paralysis within bees was known and well recorded, I think Herod Hempsall had already made a reference to it back um, that it was known in, in the 1800s. Uh, it seemed to be that this uh, disease, people were looking for a new thing to hang this disease on. And around about 1919, I think Rene made his discovery of the tracheal mite, uh, which we, we would refer to as, as acarin. And, and so it was immediately pounced upon and people thought, ah, that this, this disease must be to do with this new thing, uh, that this new idea of, of acarin tracheal mite. And so it was that uh, it took the blame, as it were, for, for this, this um, scourge that was going across the country. And it was a case that Brother Adam picked up on that. And, and he felt that uh, this was the problem, that this was the cause of the, um, the Isle of Wight disease. And he clung to that for the rest of his life, even though, as we'll see, um, attitudes towards it changed. And the, it, it's difficult to overemphasize the, the public awareness and, and the panic that went through uh, beekeepers uh, with regard to um, the, the Isle of Wight disease. And up on, on, on the screen now, you've got a list of some, some of the things that people wanted to use to try and to treat bees. And, and if your bees weren't dying before they had uh, Isle of Wight disease, by the time you've given them one of these treatments, they were going to be well in trouble, particularly frows mix in the middle there, which is uh, benzene and petrol and something else. It, you know, it's absolutely horrendous what people were prepared to run to to try and get their bees uh, right. Um, but um, eventually, um, sort of the, the disease sort of uh, managed to subside, and many beekeepers brought their bees through Isle of Wight disease. And there is an incident, you know, where, where people sort of think. Uh, perhaps it was anything that was going around in the bees that, that was attributed to Isle of Wight disease, but many good beekeepers got their bees through. Um, the 16 colonies which survived at the Abbey were split and requeens with Italian queens, which were imported directly from Bologna. Is that how you say it? Anyway, but also um, Herod Hensel, who was um, technical advisor to the Min Minivag at that time, um, overs oversaw that um, Dutch bees were imported in 1919, but also lots of Italian and French bees were also imported. And both Brother Adam and Herod Hensel um, basically said that the British black bee in its purest form was completely wiped out, which is a very um, harsh statement. And, and Adam actually said, this, this race is a thing of the past. It no longer exists. It's been completely wiped out by the mite epidemic. Our tests and our experiments have proved conclusively that the remains of the dark bee present in England today definitely do not stem from the old English bee as being conjectured from time to time, but from imports of a French variety. And that is a very contentious thing. And, and lots of people think um, that that's absolutely not true. And um, I have great empathy with them. Um, as Martin said, not everyone lost their bees to the Isle of Wight disease, and there are lots of reports of good beekeepers whose bees were relatively unaffected, but it was left up to science to provide a credible alternative. Um, it wasn't until 1963 that scientist Leslie Bailey from Rothenstag Research isolated chronic bee paralysis virus, and, and he wrote a really good, um, you can get this on the internet quite freely, he wrote um, a paper about why he thought the Isle of Wight disease was not acarin and that uh, um, most probably it was chronic bee paralysis virus, but also any colony that died at that time, they just like said, oh, that was the Isle of Wight disease and, and sort of negated responsibility for perhaps even just bad, bad beekeeping. Yeah, one, one of, one, I was going to say, one of the things we know is that one of the things that triggers uh, chronic bee paralysis virus is overcrowding. 
And if you look at the weather patterns, uh, which were really quite interesting in 1906 particularly, but those early 1900s, they had some really warm, hot weather uh, early on, early spring. And, and there's records of people sunbathing on the beach uh, in 1906 in, in sort of March time. And then they had five degrees of frost and snow in May. So this unusual weather pattern um, would have led to a, a strong buildup of bees and then this um, problem with the strong colonies being held in uh, perhaps for, for a week or two. And that is classic for um, chronic bee paralysis virus to kick off. And it can be very contagious as well. Yeah, absolutely. You, you get um, flying bees, drifting bees, robbing bees, uh, or, or an inability for um, the beekeeper to manage uh, the colonies by removing the dead bees. It's, it's an absolute um, great opportunity for disease to spread between hives. And the other thing you do notice with some of these old pictures is that bee colonies were kept very close together in those days, much, much um, better for drifting and robbing. And also, if there's not the forage in the air, that's the other thing that Leslie Bailey said, if there is not enough forage in the area to support the number of bees, then of course they will rob and they will drift and, and, and it, you know, the disease will spread. Anyway, Adam took over the running of the Apries in 1918. He'd only been working with the bees two years. So he was 16 when he started working with the bees. By the time of 1918, um, he oversaw the expansion of the colony and he built up the numbers from 45 to 100 initially. So there's um, an apiary there, which is on the Abbey site. I think that's actually the Monk's graveyard now. So they've moved that apiary since then. Um, and he, Initially, he was happy with the Burgess Perfection Hive, but then he, he started to um, think he wanted to breed larger colonies and he didn't think the Burgess Perfection Hive was large enough. And so he started looking around and casting his eye on and the one he settled on was the, the modified Dayton or the Dayton, I should say. According to Leslie Bill in her book, the bee department um, took three distinct directions. One was the management of the bees and the apiaries. So um, this is a picture taken in 1925, I think. And this is, they used to take all the bees up to the heather in August, and they borrowed the vehicles from the local co-op, which is still in Buckfast Lee now. And all the monks would get involved in um, taking the bees up to the moor, whether they were beekeepers or not. And, and that carried on. The, most of the monks I spoke to had been involved in, in taking the bees up to Heather and Father Sebastian particularly likes to tell me the worst place he's ever got stung, which I can't tell you. Um, it's a bit of a gentlemanly area, isn't it? Yeah. And here again, um, that monk there is Father Christopher and that monk there is Father Sebastian. The, those monks, no, Sebastian is 91 now, and I think Christopher must be up to 90. So that, that's them in their younger days, getting involved in taking the bees up to the moon. The other thing that um, Brother Stephen told me was, if you got stung, you got a little swig of um, Brother Adam's homemade mead. He made, apparently he made fantastic mead. He made a sparkling mead and he made a heather mead. And if you got stung while you were involved in this operation, you got a swig of mead. So if you got stung a lot all morning, you must have been ended up legless by the end of, of the day. Uh, I, I didn't realise Buckfast bees stung like that. I, th I thought that, that they used to you just, just look at them without veils and, and things on in the pictures I see. But um, is it right then that uh, I, I remember some of the monks saying that if Adam ran away, they all followed yes, him? Father Christmas, Father Christopher said they used to watch Adam and if he ran, they all ran. Anyway, the other direction that the bee department went in was the reorganisation and the upgrading of the extraction and bottling plant. And um, this is a redeployed cider press, which I think they got from White Way's cider used in 1925 to extract the heather honey. Apparently it took six men to work it and eventually they converted it to electricity and um, it could be operated by just one man. But apparently um, it was very temperamental and Adam wasn't paying attention one moment and it cracked and broke. So then they had this other one specially made by a local company in Buckfast League called Wilcox and Sons. And it was a lot more reliable. And you can see they because heather honey won't spin out because it's thick, so tropic, they used to cut the combs out and wrap it in cheesecloth. And then it went in the press. And um, eventually the, the cheesecloth was eventually replaced by nylon mesh, which they got from the local clay industry. This is um, bottling plant. 
So this is um, this honey cartons were waxed cardboard and they were designed by Brother Gabriel, used between 1926 and 1972. So part of Brother Adam's remit was that he he wanted to make the bee department, um, you know, to sell the honey. It wasn't just self-sufficiency for the monks anymore. He wanted them to make a profit. I don't know if you can see that. Can you see that? Bernie the Bolt. And um, these storage tanks were upstairs in the old bee department. Um, they were 11 in number, and each of those tanks have got a capacity of two and a half tons, built in 1928, all by Brother Adam himself from um, Red Deal. And they were all lined by tin, and I think later they were replaced by stainless steel. But Adam worked like a Trojan, and often he would be working well into the night, and sometimes he'd be going to bed at two o'clock in the morning just as the choir monks were rising to do their first office of the day. And then Adam would be up again at five. So he was a very driven man, and he was a perfectionist. And um, at, at times he drove himself too hard, and that, there are records he had at least three breaks breakdowns or not necessarily mental breakdowns but breakdowns in health where he'd just driven himself too hard and the third direction the bee department went in was the breeding of the honeybee and um, we found this ad um, this was 1929 where they're advertising queens for sale and they're not saying that they are actually saying buckfast leather colored italians which is interesting they're not they're not but first bees by themselves. So they're actually advertising as Italian bees there. Um, in order, Adam really wanted to breed a bee that he felt was resistant to acarin, which he felt was the, the sole cause of the Isle of Wight disease. That was his kind of starting point. And in order to um, refine his breeding process, he set up an isolation site right off on, on the top of Dartmoor um, in a very isolated area so that he could control the matings of the honeybee. Before that time, he was just putting selected drone colonies in the apries with the bees that he wanted to, to mate with. So, you know, anything could happen really. But this idea of an isolation site um, had been used as early as 1898 by the Swiss for breeding the native black um, Swiss bees. Yeah, it's interesting that um, the bees that we keep here around the Abbey and some of the uh, sites that Brother Adam used to use close to the Abbey, they, they would have still had the opportunity to breed with other beekeepers' drones in the area. I mean, there's a lot of beekeepers around here, and I'm sure there were in those days, but just by moving that what was it, about 10 miles to Sherberton, something like that. Mm. Um, you, you're, you're up on the high moor there, and it's uh, a different sort of area. There won't be many bee, bees or beekeepers around there. Uh, and I think he chose his ground quite well there uh, to achieve what he wanted to do. So although it's not very far away, it's a world apart in terms of beekeeping territory. And this is a picture of the home apiary in 1937. So you can see we're completely moved on to Dayton hives now. These, these hives are enormous and they were still using these hives when I first worked at the Abbey. Potentially they can hold 12 frames, but they're enormous frames. And a full honey super on one of those weighs about 54 pounds. And so the idea that Adam wanted to breed these, these colonies that were very large and therefore would make lots of honey given the right conditions. And um, he had quite a strict um, management plan. So, um, and he wanted uniformity. So in, in this, this April, there was 45 colonies, including six in the shed there. Um, he's got them all facing in, he's got them in groups of four and each entrance is facing in a different direction to minimize drifting and so that you're not going to be standing in the bee path of another colony. Um, he instigated that they had wooden top bar boards, um, crown boards, rather than the cloth boards that had been used around and the roofs were modified as well. And I think they messed around with the bee space as well. Was it a bottom bee space rather than a top one? I mean, the other thing you can see in there is the, the standardization that he, he started to work towards. Like, like Claire said, all the hives that the, the same type, no mishmash of 
uh, of different types of hives. And, and you also um, wanted everything to be the same. So if you notice each one of those hives, has got a ramp built in the front of it. And that means you can fold it up, close the entrance, and that made it much better uh, for transporting if you wanted to take it up to the heather, which one was one of the key crops for the Abbey in those days. Uh, he also had a, a, a specific type of uh, top feeder made uh, to fit on these. Uh, and he had it made to his own design. And you see this desire to standardize and control. And that comes through very strongly in his personality. Yeah, um, um, typically they would um, they would work to quite a strict timetable. So in February, um, they would change all the bottom boards. And in those days, it was pre-mesh floor. So it would be a solid bottom floor. And they, they changed all those in February. And then in March, they would equalize the colonies. So that involved taking out frames of bees and brood from strong colonies, taking them to a different apiary and um, giving them to weaker colonies. So he wanted his colonies not to be all at different stages of development. As far as possible, he wanted the colonies to be equal and at the same strength. And that obviously for a commercial beekeeper, that makes a lot of sense. But it also, as we'll talk about later, it also um, gave him a lot of problems or, or intensified a lot of problems. Um, queen cells were cut out every five, 10 days, so they did 10 day inspections, the queens were clipped. Um, if they persisted in making queen cells, you know, when they were taken out, then he would pinch out the queen and just give them a new queen. So it's, it's a different kind of beekeeping than lots of, we, certainly than I practice anyway, I don't know about you. Um, when I first worked here, we did something very similar. And, and to be honest, ripping out queen cells every 10 days all through the summer is a horrible thing to do. And the bees get demoralized and, and, and I, I felt wretched doing it. So, but that's just me. Well, I guess most people or a lot of people use um, swarm control as part of their ability to raise a new queen. But he wanted to divorce the two. He wanted his queen rearing and his swarm control um, to be two different things. And, and from that point of view... Uh, just taking out queen cells, bought in the time that he wanted, and, and then he could do his queen rearing separate to that. Yeah, it was a very separate thing. So this is inside the, the shed that you saw in the apiary there. So this was where Adam did his grafting. If you look right down towards the end of the shed, you can see a chair and a lamp. That's where the grafting went on. The big table-like thing you can see on the left-hand side is an incubator, and you could fit lots and lots of... Um, queen cells into that I think it was about 100 or so or it must it must be more than that and then if you look around the floor those are all hives of bees um, we were still working that when I worked in and you had to be on your knees to work those hives they never did very well either but on the back wall there that was where his breeder queen was so that was a much smaller hive they didn't want the breeder queen to run out of um of stuff, sperm. So they would keep her on just in a small colony and obviously just pr perhaps take out frames of brood to keep her in that, in that size box. And all of us want to improve our bees, whether we do it by rearing from our best stocks or culling our worst or, or through buying in queens. But it was the singular event of the Isle of Wight disease which triggered Adam's breeding preoccupation. And initially it was to breed a bee that was resistant to acrine, but it did become um, an obsession or a lifelong passion for him. And um, his list of, um, his wish list was, was very, um, it was a lot to ask, I think. Oh, Martin says, well, it's way too much to ask, but um, he wanted large colonies. He wanted them to forage with zeal and, and he wanted a large workforce. He wanted them to be resistant to disease and he didn't want them to swarm. And on top of all that, there's loads of other things. Um, one of them included, he didn't want them to make propolis, which we'll come on to, um, comment on later. It's interesting, you, you, you look at that and you think, yeah, what, what you actually want there is a perfect bee, but the perfect bee for Adam isn't necessarily a perfect bee for everybody else. Uh, and, and you get this idea of a, a bee that's designed for a purpose rather than um, a, a bee that fits what everybody wants. Uh, and, and we'll look at that a bit more as we go along. So the first Buckfast cross, according to Adam, was made between Apis mellifera um, liguria, which is um, not the ligustica. It's, um, a, I don't think you hear about it so much anymore, liguria, do you? 
It's um, a, a bee from the Alps and it was a leather colored bee and Apis mellifera mellifera. And he made that apparently between before 1920. Well, he didn't have an isolation site then. And apparently the black bee was wiped out by the Isle of Wight disease. So I'm thinking, how could he have made that cross? Uh, he, he must have used survivor stock, which was yeah. already a crossbred, I guess. Yeah, so I think um, I think he was actually using the, the stock that um, survived the so-called Isle of Wight disease, and then and then just folding the character, folding those into themselves until he got something that was his ideal bee. Um, I actually found this, um, which is what Brother Adam about wrote about the Buckfast strain. He said this strain has been developed at Buckfast Abbey in the course of the past sixty years. And he said, exceptional gentleness, non-swarming, um, unusual honey gathering ability. And um, he said that they're so gentle, they could be handled with impunity. Well, we have had several um, letters I found in his office where people were complaining that they, they couldn't be handled with impunity. But um, that was what he was aiming for. He was aiming for disease resistance and a very good commercial bee. And um, Basically, if you cross two races of bees, so say you've got Apis mellifera mellifera, and she's got um, a range of characteristics which she's evolved because she's um, developed in a specific set of conditions. So she's evolved to survive in a, in a very specific landscape. Um, this is the indigenous bee. You've got all those characteristics. And if you cross it with one that um, evolved in Italy in a very different um, environment. And his idea was if you cross the two, you would get the best of both worlds or you would get, um, you would get, um, what do you call it? Hybrid vigor, hybrid vigor. And um, so th those bees that displayed the hybrid vigor would then be um, at the ones that um, survived or the ones that got mated would then be overwintered at Sherberton at the isolation site and then they would spend a year in the out apiary so they could test them so they could look at the characteristics and see which ones they wanted to breed from and then queens from the colonies that displayed the characteristics they wanted they would graft from and then take back up to Sherberton so you can see it's a, it's a process of kind of inbreeding and folding in to fix the characteristics and anyone can breed a labradoodle anyone can cross two races of bees and come up with a whole load of different things but Adam's idea was he wanted to fix the characteristics and he wanted to make those um, stable usually at Sherberton, and Sherberton is a godforsaken place. It's very pretty, but it's right out on the moor and there's no forage up there and, and the weather conditions are atrocious. Even in the summer, it's, it's colder than it is anywhere else. And um, so there, there wouldn't be many local feral colonies, I don't think, and probably not many um, colonies, you know, being kept on the farms around. And I think Adam used to give queens to the to the local farmers anyway so that you know they would only have his drones around um, but the, the whole thing was because it was in an isolated area um, Adam assumed that apiary vicinity mating would be the only option for his versions with the four colonies of drones that he took there and they would be from sister colonies yeah in, interestingly if, if you look at some of the research that's been done lately it shows that drones um, from different races of bees fly at different heights and congregate at different heights. And different times a day. And at different times a day, yeah. And this is sort of genetically hardwired into them. So uh, in, in a normal situation where you've got drone congregations uh, forming, where you've got good weather patterns, it may be that, that a, 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 the Gurian queen and, and a Carniolan or an AMM may, may not ever meet. But if you're going to work in a situation like Sherbton, and the picture on the on the screen there shows you just how barren and desolate it is up there, they you're not going to get many opportunities for full-blown drone congregation areas to form up there. And, and I think you're right. I, I think a lot of the queens probably may do with a an apiary facility mating situation rather than flying into a full-blown drone congregation area. So some years he was lucky if he got any matings. There was one account I read where I think it, um, there was about um, 100 mating nukes up there, and each of those mating nukes were divided into four. So you had the potential of having 500 or so 
um, colonies up there, or little mini nukes. And so um, I think he took 500 virgins up there, and I think only 10 of those got mated, and of those 10, only two survived. You know, so some years it was just rubbish. But eventually, after 10 years or so, he had a line of bees which, when crossed with themselves, were stable. And these were his B1s, the baseline for testing other crosses and future lines. He called, um, he called his system of breeding combination breeding, which basically means he used a whole potch, hodgepodge of things. There was, there was using reciprocal matings, you know, using the drones of one race and, and, and the virgins of another. Um, he did back crossing, he did inbreeding, he did outbreeding. And basically what I think he did was he bred a lot of virgins and did heavy selection. So the whole basis of achieving the kind of bee he wanted was heavy, heavy selection, breeding lots and then selecting sometimes not very many of them to be the next donors for the next graft. Well, I guess I was going to say, I guess what you've got to do is if you want to fix characteristics, you've got to inbreed it for a while. Yeah, because a... you, you need to get um, the genes to be homozygous. You need. So, 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 so you inbreed it for a while to fix those characteristics. So many generations out of five or six, whatever. And, and then you but you're going to lose hybrid vigor by doing that. And so therefore you have to outcross it in order to put the vigor back in. Yeah. So it's a balancing act all of the time. Um, and I have read and read and read of Brother Adams breeding the honeybee. And um, it's kind of specific and vague at the same time. And maybe I'm just really stupid, but I cannot. There is no formula he lays out as how to, how to do this. I think it was he just went, went with the flow sometimes. And it would be because sometimes he didn't get good matings or some years were just a write-off. But you can see in the picture there, um, you can see the hive is divided into four and those divisions can be taken out. So it could hold two colonies, it could hold one colony, it, or it could hold four colonies. And then there's another picture of a little long hive, which also is divided into four at the bottom right hand of the picture. So those were used up there as well. Um, the picture with the people on, I, I blotted out the, the middle person because I didn't know who they were and I didn't know if they wanted to be on a PowerPoint. So I, I played safe, um, but the picture, um, outlined in blue, the head outlined in blue is Peter Donovan, who worked with P, um, Brother Adam between 1939 from the age of 12 when he was his um, smoker boy till he died in 2013 and carried on working at the Abbey after Brother Adam had died himself. So Peter Donovan was one of his most consistent helpers. And then the one outlined, the head outlined in yellow is uh, Brother Daniel, who still works at the Abbey and he, he worked with the bees for quite a long time. And then just below that, I think is Roger Kemp, who also worked with Adam and went on to become a bee inspector. David Kemp, not Roger Kemp. So they ceased, um, they, they were producing queens to sell and nukes as well, um, but they ceased selling queens to the general public in 1937 because the demand was too great and they just couldn't get the bees mated on Dartmoor. It was very stressful for Adam. So they granted licenses to weavers in Texas, which um, they sent breeder queens and they sent semen um, to um, weavers. And then they, they produced lots and lots of queens and sent them to Dr. Dr. Core in Belfast, who were the sole um, distributors of Buckfast Queens. And then later, um, I think um, Birdwood Apries in um, near Wells, Glastonbury. And also there were, you know, um, breeders were given licenses that they could breed Buckfast Queens all over the world, really, um, Denmark and um, I think Israel and um, Greece. So all the, it, they, there was a breeders association and they, they had to pay royalties um, I suppose they had to use the breeder queen and the stuff that Adam sent them, but they had to pay royalties on the amount of um, queens that they, they sold. But at some point that all broke down and I don't understand why I'm not going to comment on it. Um, Adam did diddle around with artificial um, insemination. I couldn't find a picture of artificial insemination, so I've done Brother um, Pascal um, grafting there, but they did diddle around with artificial insemination and um, in about the 1940s, they didn't get in all that well with it, but um, I think in about 1970s, under the guidance of Herr Joseph Heidinger, they got on a little bit better with some better kit. Um, 
anyway. Around 1940, um, Adam had another major health issue and he went to convalesce in Northumberland or in the northwest of England. And he did a lot of reading there. And one of the books that he read was um, a book by Ludwig Armbruster, um, who wrote a theoretical book about bee breeding and genetics. And he was looking at the possibilities of breeding different races of bees, so combining different races to produce these hybrids, which were going to be far superior. And at that time, um, eugenics, if you like, was very popular. You know, all of agriculture was um, looking or seeking to improve, you know, the crops they could grow or the milk yields they could get by crossbreeding and breeding specific things. And it was a very... Um, it was a very popular thing at that time. And Adam thought, well, why can't we do that with bees? Yeah, and, and the other thing you need to think about is that in those earlier times, people didn't keep bees necessarily as a hobby like they do today. You know, but we're all prepared. If our, if our bees make some honey and, and they sort of cover their cost near, near as damn it, then um, th that's all we ask for. But in those days, you know, m money was tighter uh, and people didn't have the spare cash to indulge a, a hobby like that and so their bees had to pay and you can see how uh, in getting a bee that was going to pay its way more and and make a surplus of honey was going to be a, a thing worth striving for between 1948 and 1987 he traveled the world um, and, and he basically went to do his own research so he traveled to loads of different countries and um, looked at the bees there and assessed made his own personal assessment of their qualities and he sent queens back and um, he would, they would be used at Sherberton. He would cross different races together and form different lines. So he was interested in, you know, loads of different crosses and then crossing them up in with his B1 to see how they performed. And um, he was funded to do that by the Abbey. He wouldn't have been able to do that, you know, because it was after the war, um, money would have been tight, but the Abbey funded him to do that. But inbreeding was always a challenge and particularly even with the B1 line, you know, if you if you fold in genetics too much all of the time, you're going to get problems like diploid drones and, and, and you know, honeybees are very susceptible to inbreeding. So they always had to be careful. Um, also, when with breeding, you know, might be selecting for good characteristics, but you might be also losing, you know, it's a, it's a, a tricky balancing act. And breeder queens um, are inbred in order to um, produce homozygous alleles. And this ensures that characteristics are more likely to get passed on to the next generation. But you have to always guard um, for inbreeding, but also um, the diploid drone phenomenon, which is where um, they drone sort of in between bees, somewhere between drones and um, worker bees are born and, the, and, the, the, and you get spotty brood. I'm going to pass over to Martin now because Martin's an ex-pig farmer, don't you know? And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, um, um, not not a pig on the screen, but but the same sort of um... this this cow. I took myself. We had another cow in, and Roger said you weren't allowed to use it, so I went out. No, I took this in the summer, and this bull is called Roger because that's his job. <laughs> The, the, the thing with this animal here, and the reason we, we've, we've digressed into um, mammals here, is the fact that um, farmers are looking to improve performance, um, but, but he's only a part, uh, his genetics that he carries are only a part of uh, what, what he wants. Um, he, he needs to be well fed, he needs to have a good series of management, and, and he also needs to be kept in, in, in a good environment. But with, a, with an animal like that, it's much easier to do than it is with bees. For example, um, feeding in the environment for bees. Um, if, if you took two identical queens, put one in the middle of Dartmoor and put one in the middle of a load of oilseed rape, you're going to get markedly different um, variations in, in terms of what those colonies are able to achieve. But if you take a, a, an animal like that, you can put it in a shed, you can control the stand of husbandry you can control the food goes into it you can control the environment it's kept under and you can for want of a better way of putting it put it on test uh, and the animal then is is as you have a clear representation of what the genetics in that animal are able to achieve but with bees it's not so um 
with bees you've got all the problems of um, honeybees don't you know mate in the hive they mate on the wing so you control you can't really control unless you use an isolation site or artificial insemination. you can't really control who they mate with um, and then what is actually passed on because there are a lot of characteristics which we think are inherited which might be to do with the environment so some characteristics aren't very heritable so honey yield gentleness calmness have heritability levels of 0 0.27 0 0.37 0 0.38 they can be improved by selection and breeding but other characteristics swarming behavior hygienic behavior involve um, loads of different um, genes and they're not very heritable at all and so um, a bee that for example carniolans are supposed to have a high swarming instinct but is that to do with where they are or is it to do with you know the the genetics of the queen you know it's it's very difficult to separate out what is genetics and what is how they're handled how they're how they're looked after um all kinds of things all kinds of variables yeah there's some research came out of Tehran university and and they showed that if you wanted to um instigate a breeding program for bees, the character that you were trying to improve needed to have a heritability factor uh, closer to 0 0.25. If it was significantly below that, then um, you may be on a bit of a hiding to nothing, or it may land up being more variable than you want. Um, my slides started to go by themselves then, so I'm just going to go back quickly. Um, with bees, the environment in which they are in, they're kept influences their performance and behaviour. So you know like martin said if they're in a field of oilseed rape or if they're in a more um, varied agricultural landscape or if they're on on dartmoor they will behave differently that's that and breeders um is no mean, mean feat to actually breed the honeybee you know there's so many things go back go back there's so many things um, which you have to consider and and you might select for one thing and then and look out for you know negatives might happen as well and also they have to select the drones and they have to look at the 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 where you put the drones um many breeders use artificial who's going ahead it's, it's going it's doing that all by itself um so many breeders nowadays use artificial insemination to assure the desired crosses so you get your breeder queens and then outbreed those but it's it's all um hugely um, complicated and you have to get your timings right and, and you have to be really careful about um, inbreeding and all kinds of things. Um, for me, um, it's, it's, it's something I, I don't even really want to do at all. I'm going to pass this over to Martin because you put these slides in, Martin. Um, yeah, so, so just looking at um, beekeeping skills and the standard of husbandry, um, you know, I, I, I know a lot of people that have bought queens from the same uh, out, outlet and they, you know, some people you go along and you see and, and the, the bees are going fantastic and they're doing really well. Uh, and, and in other places, they're, they're, they're struggling along and there's more to it than just the genetics, um, you know, whether they're well fed, whether they've been fed at the right time. Whether, whether they've had the, the management in order to see if there's any swarming or whether they need more space or whatever. But, but these things um, are, are, can, cannot be discounted when, when you're looking to uh, control the performance or, or judge the performance. So and of what course, you... well, you're, 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 the thing is you're judging the performance of a queen against the colony she's in. And, and, and... But also how the bee pupil manages them. This is yours as well. Yeah, it, th th this is this is the other thing. If you get a group of beekeepers together at the end of the season and people say, um, you know, what sort of a season have you had? Very few people say, I've had a lovely season. My bees have been well tempered and that, that they've been great. And, and I've really enjoyed looking after them. They all say, oh, yeah, they made 100 pounds of honey or they made 50 pounds of honey or whatever. And so the yardstick that we put uh, against bees doing well is not a yardstick that the bees themselves would use. So what you're saying is when we're selecting traits for honeybees, we're selecting them for ourselves and not for the bees. Yeah, because the, the bottom line is that evolution, um, natural selection, whatever you want to call it, would not have produced a bee like Brother Adam 
produced. Um, you know, he famously said, we can improve upon nature because nature is not gonna, um, going to um, select. bring, se select, yeah, select, select characteristics for high honey yield. It's not going to select characteristic for low swarming, and it's not going to select uh, characteristics for a very docile behavior. Yeah, so this is Jane. Um, this is our colony. She's about, I don't know, 20 foot up in an ash tree. And she's been, well, probably she saw twice a year, Jane. You know, um, we don't do anything to her because we can't reach, but we've watched her with interest. And, um, you know, she survives and she probably doesn't make excess honey. She just survives. And that is what the honeybee itself would do. And what we do with bees is, is actually totally unnatural. You know, even natural beekeepers, if you, the minute you put a super or extra space on honeybee, it's not natural beekeeping anymore. Yeah, and just to clarify what we've said on the screen there, um, for, 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 for bees in the wild, their, their ability to swarm and move their genetics to a new area, or, or this high level of genetic recombination that they, they have at my, meiosis, um, it, it is sufficient for them to freshen their genetics and keep them going. That's all that natural selection is required from them, not this intensive bee breeding that, that mankind wants to put on them. So just an update, about 1940, um, Brother added, added a new line into his B1 stock, which came from a French um, apis mellifera mellifera supplied to him by his friend, Mr. Gale. In 1960, another line was added from a Greek cross. And, and, and the thing, the point is the buckfast bee was never a race of bee. Um, it's a subspecies bee or not even a subspecies of bee. Um, the closest you could get to describe it would be an inbred hybrid. And it was, as, as he went around the world and, and tried these different crosses and made these other lines, he was tinkering with it all the time. All the time he was in trying to improve and get it closer to his ideal of the bee. He was breeding for large and productive colonies that would deliver good honey, and he wanted them to be frugal and gentle and be resistant to the eat. He, he wanted a lot. He actually said, our aim is a progressive, positive and permanent improvement to the honeybee to correspond with the demands of modern beekeeping. So this is where, this is where I, I divide off from Brother Adam. Is there such a thing as the perfect bee? And because I work at the Abbey, every week I get emails um, or demands to send buckfast bees out or can you supply buckfast bees and I have to say well we don't actually breed the buckfast bee or we don't maintain the buckfast bee at the abbey anymore and I get <gasps> and why not and, and I have my reasons I don't believe there's any such thing as the perfect bee brother Adam believed he could improve on nature but I think that there's been a cost to our refinement of the honeybee I think you know we on balance we've done more damage than improvement in some ways. I feel very, very uncomfortable about the use of an isolation site by because restricting the drone population produces colonies which are less fit as a colony. And I love our bees. Um, our bees are mongrels, what Adam would have called mongrels. Um, I enjoy the diversity in characters. I appreciate the fact that they perform differently. I feel passionate about the concept of locally adapted bees, but I accept the limitations of our situation. So although I'm saying locally adapted bees, actually um, we can't control who, what kind of bees are around us. So um, there's, there's a guy three miles down the road who imports Danish queens. So that obviously affects the genetics of our bees. Um, so they're not, um, they're not, um, locally adapted bees in the truest sense of the word. And also because I select, you know, I have characteristics which I prefer and I prefer smaller colonies. I prefer a more modest girl. I prefer um, slightly more resilient or um, robust kind of girl. I'm not after huge, great honey crops, although, you know, they do give us lots of honey, but I, you know, my ideal bee is completely different than Brother Adam's. And, um, I'm really happy with what we've got. Each apiary has got a selection of characters. So we tend to breed, well, we tend to pick ones that are nice to handle because we're teaching. We, we pick the ones that are nice to handle. So we do have some slightly eggier, what I call eggier girls, girls that make lots of babies. And, um, but we tolerate them because they're great for teaching. And then we have um, colonies which are slightly perhaps a little bit more challenging to handle, but then they've got other 
good characteristics which I value. So I like the idea of having lots of different types of bee in an apiary. It's, it's a bit like you don't put all your eggs in one basket. And what, how we've achieved that? Well, basically you could say, well, we've, we've bred from the ones we like the best or we, it's more like we've culled our worst. So it, it needs continual tweaking. You can't, you can't just think, well, that's it. We've arrived, I got my perfect bee because any, any mating can go off on a slightly different tangent. And so, you know, there are some that you tolerate and some that you don't tolerate. And, and sometimes, you know, some, some years you don't get a mating and you're just happy with what you got. So it is planned, but it's partly accident as well. And, and, and appreciating, um, lots of different characteristics and, and we can all do that on the right time of day um, with the right colony we can all do this with our bees you know I think our bees are fabulous you know they're nice temper but there are some days when you wouldn't do that and the bottom line is I think mongrels are healthy they survive and they've got character and we, we I am I'm, I try not to be anthropomorphic about bees but I do name all the colonies they all have names but it's a way of it's fun um, but it's a way of keeping us keeping track. And we do keep very good records of the line. So up in the home apiary there, we've got the Tanyas, the Helens, the Gales, the Jojos. What's your favourite one up there, Martin? Rosie? You like old Rosie, don't you? So um, the ones that Martin likes are different than the ones that I like. You know, we, we do tease each other about it. But the, the thing is, mongrels are not unmanageable. You can gently select or improve to your own um, preferences and with a bit of patience and flexibility but you need to keep on tweaking all of the time you know you can't just rest on your laurels because you know sometimes they will go you know um, usually the gales are lovely but every now and then you get a gale that's not lovely so you um, pinch her out and replace her with a helen or something um, and I'm very much of the Keith Delaplane um, one of my heroes who writes about bees I'm very much about diversity. So um, the reason I hate the idea of an isolation site or restricting the drones that the virgin mates with is um, it's going against everything that the honeybee has evolved to do. And, and you need to keep your options open. And um, the honeybee, you know, the more diverse a colony has got, the more unrelated drones that the, the virgin mates with, the more subfamilies you'll have in your colony and they'll have a, a better range of skills. Not every bee is the same. Not every bee is a Jill of all trades. You do get specialists in a colony. And polyandry ensures genetic diversity. Um, and not only that, um, queens that have mated multiply with um, loads of different drones have better gut bacteria. They, they've got a better pheromonal output and they're looked after. Um, and I trust I trust my bees. Um, so you can select for very specific characteristics, say you could select for hygienic behaviour, but inadvertently you might be losing something which is really important. And I actually have read some research um, which was written about in the American Bee Journal by Alison McAfee, who said bees that are heavily selected for hygienic behaviour actually are unable to process toxins as well as bees that haven't been heavily selected in that way. So you might be selecting for something really good and important, but you might also be losing something which is really important because we're not that clever. And your colonies could become lopsided in their skills. This is one of Martin and my favorite book. Um, and he, he has a whole chapter where he, he basically slates bee breeding. And um, he says, strong colonies which do not swarm and are not defensive and are favoured not only by beekeepers, but also by pests and pathogens. So although beekeepers view swarming as a bad trait, actually it's the way hot colonies, you know, splitting a colony keeps her healthy. You're giving them a new start. You're losing lots of varroa by providing a brood break. And you, you are um, propagating your bees in a natural way. This is, um, this is one of my favourite colonies in the community. This is the Lady Eleanor. And the La Lady Eleanor makes loads of propolis. She's a propolis queen. And that makes it difficult to handle the bees because everything is stuck together. Um, 
but she's a survivor and, and, and brother Adam tried to breed propolis collecting out of this, you know, he, it was an inconvenience to him and he didn't want propolis in the hives and actually propolis um, is very heritable characteristic. I think it's 0.87 on the heritability thing. And um, this picture here that you can see with the, the, the dead bees in the goo, one year we made um, some, some thymol sort of patties to control varroa and um, it was sort of homemade thymol treatment and the bees hate the smell of thymol, they absolutely loathe it. And this colony was trying to cover it up by this sheet of propolis which she was building over to get rid of it. And also she, she, she um, filled her entrance up this year, this is this year's photograph, she's um, completely sealed up her entrance and just left these lovely bee spaces in. I was so proud of her when she did that. And propolis gathering, um, one year, again, we made homemade thymol treatment. I don't use thymol anymore. I hate it. But um, one year we, we impregnated these washing up cloths with thymol. We put it on the top and the bees in the same apiary dealt with the thymol in two different ways. One lot shredded and just spat it out the entrance and the other lot propolized them. It is a very heritable trait and it's quite... Um, quite interesting that you had this two different approaches by the bees to, to get rid of this nasty thymol smell. That those are the shredders and those are the propolizers. Now, one of the things Adam did was he, he tried to get rid of propolis and we all know that propolis is useful to the colony in that it contains lots of antimicrobials and it is part of their social immunity. And one of the things that you don't read in any of the books, and I'm not sure when it first occurred, but AFB was, was a real problem at the Abbey. And because Adam was high up on a pedestal by then, um, he didn't really want to own up about it. And probably he was sending semen off to America and breeder queens off to that, and it would have, um, he would have lost a lot of face by admitting that he had this disease problem. So he actually got teramycin from his doctor and he was, do he was dosing the bees with antibiotics illegally and actually got found out and then math got involved. But this problem was rumbling on as late as 1998 when math then became DEFRA, was it then? And um, at that point, hundreds of hives were burned at the Abbey because of, and I'm not saying that it was because he bred propolis out, um, but maybe selective breeding, you know, you just can't control everything. Also, equalising was not very clever then. Yeah, I was going to say, it, we talked about this earlier in the talk, that his desire for standardisation and uh, equalising brood. Yeah, it, it's all right. I'm not suggesting he didn't know what he was doing, but he was also moving the frames with the bees on. That makes it harder to see, to be but honest. But also very early in the season. Early in and the you season. Don't see, you don't see EFB or AFB early in the season because the bees are cleaning it out. It's later when they're foraging strongly that you'll notice it. Yeah. Anyway, moving on. Um, the other thing with um, a lot of people seem to think that the Buckfuss bee is... Um, something they could improve their own stock. So they've got crabby bees and think, I'll buy a buckfuss queen, they're nice and gentle. Um, I'll put that in my house and my bees will go lovely. And perhaps they do, but that won't hold true for the next generation because anything could happen. You might get a nice bee in the next generation, but you might get, um, you know, there have been real horror stories. And um, when I first worked here, we had 400 colonies um, the buckfast bee wasn't, you know, they were all descendants of buckfast bees, but some of them were just atrocious. It took two of us to work, them. one on the smoker, one of them with big leather gloves on, trying to not get stung to death while we looked through them. So um, improving your bees with um, a commercially bred bee, if it's an inbred hybrid, it's just a short term solution. It's only a quick fix and it's not lasting. No, because that, 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 queen that is produced by, by um, you know, swarming, supersedure, or whatever, will need to mate with, with the bees in your area. And therefore, eventually, you will uh, come back to a more localised bee, unless you want to get on the treadmill and start buying in queens every year. And, and some commercial people do that and still well, do that. Well, commercial beekeepers do, because they haven't got time to be breeding queens. So, you know, for the hobby beekeeper, it's not a way of improving your stocks. So moving on quickly, I'm aware that we've rabbited on long enough. Um, I joined the Abbey in 2008. Then we had 400 colonies. Um, it was honey production. This was our honey processing machine. I hated that machine. Um, 
everything was geared towards honey production. We used to go through the hives every 10 days, every single hive we had 17 different apries and just rip out queen cells. Um, I was thrilled to be working at the Abbey and to be working with bees at the time. But after about a year or so, my back was killing me and I thought, well, I just can't go on with this. But then um, things did begin to change. Also, things had got very run down by that point. So this is the home apiary shed. If you look at close up, you can see some of these hives were 60 or 70 years old and um, everything was falling apart, apart from them being horrendously heavy to work those hives. And then 2010, the monks decided to downsize and change and um, they, they kind of offered that we could go educational and, and, and cut down the number of hives and, and just change direction because even with 400 hives, we weren't really covering our wages. Um, there was no monks working the bees then. And so um, it wasn't um, commercially viable as a department. So one of the first things we did was get the bees off the old datants and we Bailey frame changed them into Langstroth is what I inherited. I didn't choose them. Um, and the hives that we had were poorly made from pine and not very well. Um, they just weren't very good quality, but that's what we had. And we just barely frame changed and we still got Langstroth now. And they're a nice hive to work, but the, the equipment was rather shocking, wasn't it? We cut down the bees from 400 to around 30. Um, we have rewilded the home apiary, so no, no longer is it that lovely, neat um, velvet lawn um, affair that you saw in the beginning. We, we've really focused on um, making it a wild, pollinator-friendly space. And Martin's been thrilled this year because we've got yellow rattle in there for the first time, so um, we can get more wildflowers in there next time. Up till this yeah, um, we've been running courses, not just courses, um, taste today's um, workshops. We try and um, complement the BBKA um, programme. So we don't really stick to the BBKA programme, but we try and complement it. So we don't see ourselves in competition, but just, you know, we're a non-exam based way of learning. Um, we've got, we've moved away from the old Abbey Brother Adam um, offices and we're now in a purpose-built barn and um, we run a community apri every Sunday afternoon, well we used to until things change um, and that's a very informal thing, it's more like a, a sort of support group really, it's very informal, I let them play, they wanted a top bar hive so they had a top bar hive, in actual fact we had to kill her this year didn't we because she had chronic bee paralysis and she was going nowhere so we, we euthanized her. Um, got Martin in what year? Um. Come on, Martin, keep up. Well, I know. Well, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, full time, but before that, be inspecting in the summer and working at the Abbey in the winter. So um, it's, it's been a few years now, to be fair. Anyway, um, he's very good at his job and he's very useful, um, doing lots of practical things. And he's a real skip rat. So we have a wonderful wood skip near here. Um, mo most of our dummy boards, dummy boards that we've made this year have come out the skip, haven't they? Yeah, we, we, we like to think we continue in the frugal way, you know, if we can make do and mend it, don't run away with the idea that we're, we're a, a, a wash with money. <laughs> yeah, you know, a department with, with, with um, unlimited resources, you could see from that original picture of the roofs that were being put on the Langstroth, you know, you'd have a job to make a roof with less wood. Uh, so, so we don't have the best of gear and, and we make do and mend a lot, but we, we also learn a lot by doing that. And, and to be fair, if we did really want something, the Abbey are very supportive and, and I can't tell you how lovely the monks are to work with. I would never, um, never diss them in any way. Um, this is, we always run an observation hive. This one takes six Langstroth frames. She's, she's got brood in now. Um, old Rosie, she is in there, or one of the old Rosie. She's got brood in now, so we're keeping an eye on her. And she's a good barometer for what's happening with the rest of the hives. And we always let her swarm. We always learn loads from her. Um, I've learned more from the observation hive than um, all those years of opening up colonies and ripping out queen cells. We like playing. I stole this idea from Jim Slade. This is, I always like to have a few of these frames in each colony. It's not for drone production. I just like to put this plywood. Oh, where is it? You put one here. Can you see, can you see that Martin? Yep. 
So we put a couple of these in each colony. I just like the fact that they can draw what comb they want to and they get to do that lovely hanging or um, what do they call it um, when they hang like that? Um, festooning. Festooning, thank you. Um, festooning and, and it's a natural behaviour and it is not I'm a natural beekeeper. I just like them to do some of those things without foundation. We have, um, we welcome family groups. I've blotted them all, I blurred them all up there because I didn't ask their permission for that. We work with charities, this is our favourite one. This is not about beekeeping, but um, working with kids and giving them confidence and, and getting to appreciate the natural world. We worked also um, with Help for Heroes and another one called Farm Able. So we're really open to using bees as a well-being tool as well as as an educational tool. We've also worked um, for a couple of years with farmers, teaching farmers how to keep bees, which is something else, isn't it? <laughs> they all come in late talking about breached births and, and herbal lays and things, but I've learned as much. <laughs> well, they, they, they do have one advantage over most beekeepers. They've all usually got a man or two or, or a, a JCB with a cherry picker so they can get their swarm down at the tree. This, this um, is on a farm just above Widdicombe, and that's right on the high moor. So probably um, John Dracup's season is about three weeks behind ours because it's up on the moor. And he's actually got black bees from Mount Edgecombe there, um, which we were doing a little shared project with Cathy Lovegrove and, and using seeing how the black bees fare up on the moor. So, um, you know, we, 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 we're wide reaching in our interests. We've got no pressure to provide honey for the sale in the shops, which is really lucky, really. Um, we, you know, the, they are very supportive of how we work here. We don't make any money for them. We, we don't even cover our wages. Um, so we're really, really lucky to have this job. So we're coming towards the end now, but you'll be glad to know. Um, we owe our jobs to Brother Adam. I, I, I don't mean to diss him. I appreciate what he did. I appreciate, you know, his whole life was honeybees. You know, it, it was his, it was his passion and it was his distraction in life. And given, you know, that he was kind of taken from his family when he was 11, and then he found something which really captured his imagination. And I, I always think if I was at one of those fictional dinner parties and I was sat next to Brother Adam, would we have something to talk about? Would he look down at me and, and think, oh, you know, she's, she's rubbish. She's not doing anything right. I think probably we would get on OK um, because we both feel passionately about bees and you can't take that away from the man. You know, he, he did an awful lot to raise positive awareness for honeybees. And although I don't do things or we don't do things in the same way as Adam, I um, have the, the utmost respect for, you know, the life that he gave them. Anything to add to that, Martin? Oh, I, I just think, you know, you, you, you can't underestimate his contribution to, to, to beekeeping and bee breeding at, at that particular time. And I'm sure he would have moved on. And, and you know, he, he, he ceased to keep bees uh, just as Varroa got hold. And I'm sure he would have taken that on board and would have worked with other people to see if there was a... a... Not with those big colonies. <laughs> but, 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 but he, well, he may have had to have modified his thoughts, but it, it would have given him a new challenge. And I think he was always looking to uh, improve uh, um, his stocks and, and to get his bees to meet the challenges of the years ahead. And, and he, would have, he would have had to go at rising to the challenge of Varroa. Okay, and that's it. We can end show now. End slideshow. Stop share. No. Well, thanks very much, um, uh, uh, Claire and Martin. Um, that's given us uh, a little bit more to think about than the usual fluffy stuff that we read on the uh, uh, online. Um, <clears throat> we've got another session um, fairly soon, so I'll just um, uh, keep the questions down to. Um, uh, uh, a fairly a small number. Um, <clears throat> you mentioned bee breeding instead of queen, instead of rearing. What resources would you suggest to get a greater understanding of this fas fascinating subject? <clears throat> ah. <laughs> <laughs> well, there, there's some great books out there, um, but but one of the best um, breeders that I know. I uh, actually went abroad to do quite a lot of work. Uh, he, le he learned grafting, um, learned about breeding in America, and also kept in touch with the Danish beekeepers. Uh, and, and so I, I guess he's gone to where um, so some of the um, Buckfast 
uh, things things were uh, actually shipped out to and, and sort of learned his trade there a bit and then come back and put it into practice over here. So uh, I, th I think you need a mentor. You need someone to show you the ropes if you're going to really get into this. You can read about it as much as you want to, but and, and uh, you, you need to know someone that's really gone and done it properly. All right. Okay, I think what somebody was after was probably a book or a whatever. Um, I don't know. Is the answer to no. that one okay? Um, we'll just take one more then. What is your opinion of the so called Buckfast uh, Queens and Bees now being sold everywhere and advertised with all the traits brother Adam aspired to? We even I have them for sale here in Ireland, uh, where we're trying to protect a largely pure AMM. Um, I think the people that um, there's no restrictions now, as far as I can see, there's no licensing on, on selling Buckfast Queens. And I think uh, and certainly a lot of the Danish breeders um, aren't using the same stock that Adam used. They're not using the same line. What they're doing is using the same techniques. So they may be even using different crosses, but all they're doing is producing lines which they can cross with each other to produce um, a stable bee so it you know they're no longer the same color they're just going for a breeding a bee which is gentle prolific low swarming those characters they're aiming for the the same characteristics but using the same kind of techniques so it, it would be um, a lot of selection and, and and they take themselves very seriously and and they do produce there's no doubt about it they do produce a good commercial bee but um it's 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 technique rather than actual the same line. Okay. Uh, well, sorry, I've got to uh, got to leave it there. Um, thanks very much, um, Claire and uh, Martin. Uh, thanks very much for listening. And we've got another session in uh, half an hour now. So okay. Thank you very much.